Hello, everyone. Good day to you, wherever you're joining me from. This is Health World View or Word for Word Talk. It depends on where you're watching me from. Well, today I want to share with you about what is going on. If you've watched my other video, you see about uh, about this um, sub sub submissible vessel that has been missing us since um, Sunday. Since Sunday, and we have they have five people on board, and their names are. Hamish Harden, British businessman. Then you have um, uh, Shazada Dawood, a vice chairman of Aero Corporation from Pakistan with his son, who is a 19 year old Suleiman. Uh, then you have Paul Henry, <clears throat> Henry Nagulet, uh, also, um, is the people call him PH as Sagada, uh, also is a diver and a Titanic researcher. Then you have Stockton Rush, uh, the CEO of the Ocean Gate, uh, was also on board the company that that that, that, that is sponsoring this. What I find out about this is that this Titanic, uh, sorry, this the, the, the Titanic tour, what is um is risky, okay? It's risky on its own going underwater. Which is about two um twelve thousand five hundred feet down below the uh, Atlantic, yeah. Okay, then the place uh, right under water there is very very dark, dark and freezing. I forgot that if it, uh, I watch a video where um Hattie, uh, uh, Hamish Hattie was reading what was said about this vessel. It's an experimental vessel, okay? It's an experimental ve uh, vessel. This uh, submissible vessel has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body. So it's like, you just build something, put people on and say, well, we're gonna go experiment, let's go. Okay, or oh, you, you just you build a plane, you, know, you have a company that build a plane, you put all your stuff together the way you want to do it, and then you just, okay, let's go. It's experimental. So, um, there they, they, they went with this, you know. Uh, uh, what he was reading, really, what they have to sign when they could cause a uh, physical injury, they could go through trauma, they could be disabled, they could even lead to death. We know those are part of the risk that could actually have that will come with it anyway, but it's so so um disturbing that we have we have from this is a Sunday, and um I think they were about an hour plus on the trip or so when they lost contact. They don't know where they are. My thought is, could they be trapped within the Titanic? You know, inside it. It's so, 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 um, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I don't know what to say, painful, um, frustrating, or the word to say, well, they will be clicking, will be going on bad because the people don't know, they don't know what to tell you. you. Even if you can swim, how do you swim from, from, uh, the surface? I mean, from underwater to the surface. How do you do that? And it's freezing. I mean, if it was warm water all the way through, okay, they couldn't go on it. But once they're freezing, how do you, at the point you can't do anything, you know? So, like I said in that video, pray for these people. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. I want to show you a video of uh, um, Mike, Dr. Michael Gillen. Uh, he was a journalist. Uh, with ABC uh, UK, uh, he was trapped on that Titanic for about an hour, 2000 and, uh, two, in two, uh, 2000, 2000. Um, so he has experience on this uh, submissive officer trapped on the water for about an hour. You're gonna hear from him exactly what he experienced while he was there. He was the first TV um, correspondent sent underwater to investigate this Titanic. So he was like, wow, let's go, you know? <laughs> so, but um, 
fortunately for, for, fortunate for him, he's here to tell his story. He said that I want these other five people as well to be able to come out and tell their story as well. That would be great. That is the best hope we have. That is what we pray for, that they will come and tell their own story. Um. So anyway, let me play the video for you. Remember where they are at as we speak right now is 12,500 feet below the Titanic, um, sorry, the Atlantic, okay? Also, there is no light. Its temperature is freezing. Water pressure is larger than 300, um, is three, 380 times larger, yeah, than land. Equivalent of about uh, being trapped in a hundred story building made of lead. Can you imagine that? I can't even imagine it, I've heard it, but yeah, lead. That's heavy, you know, uh, and how deep they are from the Atlantic is is um, the the depth of the ocean where they are is nine times it's uh, state Empire State Building, nine times as Empire State Building. Can you believe that? You know, when you place on each other, place on each other. That's how deep. Just the, uh, how do you even imagine that? Oh my words. Anyway, let's go and let's hear from. This man, Mr. Michael Gullin. We have picked up sounds of banging from very close to the site where the Titanic tourist sub is believed to be. Well, we're joined by Dr. Michael Guillen, the first television correspondent to visit the Titanic wreck over 20 years ago. He filmed his experience as the submersible that he was in got stuck in the wreckage. Here's what happened. I felt a little bit of a boom, didn't you? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, oh my gosh, look at these things. Oh my gosh, look at the size of these things. Oh my gosh, so are we stuck or what? He's trying, I guess, to back out, but we're still feeling this real scraping sound. And as you can see, the whole view is clouded by this rusting. We're out. Oh my god. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, my god. Thank god. My goodness. Yeah. Well, Dr. Michael Guillen joins us now. Very good morning to morning. you. Um, do you know what, Michael? Richard and I both listened to an interview yesterday that you did talking about your experience, but you have been so overwhelmed, haven't you? Because you know what it is like to be trapped in the way that these five poor souls are trapped in that sub. I heard you move to tears by that. I just, you know, firstly, just want to say it must be a very difficult time for you having been there. Just, just you know what it is like. Yes. Uh, well, good morning, Richard and Susanna. And just even watching that video right now, it's, uh, well, it's uh, <laughs> something that I will always live with. Uh, it's very emotional for me. I feel a special uh, kindred spirit with these Poor souls who are down there. I, I feel so close to them, almost to the point where I feel like I'm down there again. Um, it is very emotional for me, but um, I, uh, I I just want to say that this news about um, these sounds that they're picking up. This is what I've been saying all day yesterday. That hydro you you communicate from a submersible like that with the mothership with the research ship through hydrophones, not uh, electromagnetic waves, radio waves don't uh, communicate well in the ocean because it's salty, it's ionic. So it's basically acoustic. It's akin to the same principle you use with two, can, two tin cans connected by a string. And I was saying all day yesterday that if indeed their hydrophone failed so early in the mission, less than two hours down, which means they never even made it to the bottom, it took about two and a half hours to get down to the bottom, uh, then the, at the very least, they could just take their cups and bang on the side of the sub. Um, that's what I would do if I were down there, and I'm sure that's what the pilot would recommend to everybody. They have five people. They could make quite a racket simply by rapping on the inside of the sub. Sound communicates extremely well in water, much better than it does even in sound. And so I, I when I heard this news just a short while ago, it gave me great hope that perhaps they're still alive. Because if indeed this is these sounds that they claim to have picked up 
are coming from the people inside, wrapping on the inside of the sub, they can triangulate its location. Then, of course, it's a question of then once you tr once you locate them, depending on how deep they are, how do you get them back up? This sub, I'm told, was designed so that in case of an emergency, it would float to the top. Uh, and that didn't happen. And that was also a big concern of mine yesterday. So I was saying, well, if there is a catastrophic failure of sound, why aren't we hearing people rapping on the side? And why didn't this thing come up? Because I can guarantee you, and you saw my pilot, Victor, he was a former MiG pilot. He's a man used to dealing with situations of life and death and uh, uh, dealing under pressure. I know that that pilot in the Titan, uh, currently missing, would have been doing everything he could to get that sub to the surface. So a little bit of uh, good news this morning. I, I, you know, I think to myself, and I was thinking all day yesterday, that these waters in the North Atlantic are treacherous. They're, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it, the, w w down below, it's very cold. The pressures are very high. I'll give you a little illustration in a moment of, uh, of how big the pressures are. And I'm just hoping and praying that the waters that claimed the lives of all those people on the Titanic more than 100 years ago and that almost claimed my life uh, won't claim the life of, of uh, this sub and its occupants. But just to give you, Richard and Susanna, an idea of, of the pressures down there, what we did before we dove is that we painted up some styrofoam cups. This is, uh, you can see it says September uh, mm -hmm. uh, two. 2000 and then it was September is my wedding anniversary so I thought I'd treat my wife it says happy anniversary sweetie what we did is we put some of these cups on the outside of our submersible they were put in a one of those onion skin bags and this is how they came back so this is what happens when you're down there that far down two and a half miles down all the air is squeezed out of the styrofoam cup and this is the result so you can imagine what it'll do to a human body this is no joke this is not I know they talk, talk about it being a tourist submersible. That concerns me. That, that it's almost like too flippant. This is a very serious matter, um, uh, something that should be taken seriously and not to be joked about. This is not a Disneyland ride. Can we take, can we take you back 23 years? Um, you reached the Titanic quite safely in your, in your submersible. You were, you were yeah. going around it, viewing it. it, must have been an extraordinary experience. And then yes. you got caught up in one of these very deep water currents and your submarine lost control, didn't have the power to fight the current and it was forced into the huge propeller of the ship and it was wedged there, it was jammed there. Take us, yeah. now the clip that we showed was 30 seconds long. It didn't convey the horror that slowly began to overcome all of you in there and the panic as the minutes right. became 15 minutes, became half an hour, moved towards an hour and you couldn't get yeah. the damn thing out. Tell us about what that was like for you. I think the drama for me began when we had finished our tour of the bow. Everything had gone well. We had a moment of silence in honor of the people who lost their lives down there. Because remember, this is not just a wreck. This is a sacred gravesite. This is where people lost their lives. And just to thinking, I was there. I could see the Titanic. It was as close to me as my hand is to my face right now. And as we were departing from the bow, everything was going fantastically. You, you travel across what's called the debris field. This is where all the stuff spilled out of the Titanic when it broke in two. The bow came straight down. The stern did a somersault, landed on its back. So we were heading towards the stern. It was the second half of our journey, if you will. And what I noticed right away was how shiny the propeller was. And you're right, uh, Richard, that propeller is huge compared to the size of our little sub. And I was just captivated by it. I was like, wow, it's so shiny because it's got brass in it and doesn't tarnish that much down there. The rest of the Titanic is gray and decaying. And then I sensed that we were speeding up. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd. We should be slowing down. We're approaching the propeller. Jeez. And we later found out that indeed, as you indicated, there are very strong uh, underwater currents, strange as it may sound, yes, very strong underwater currents. And it was just our bad luck that our sub got caught in that and it was jammed us right into the uh, blades of the propeller, got caught behind the blades. And this is what you're seeing on, on the video there. Um, my initial sense was I didn't want anybody in the sub to panic. We had been warned ahead of time that when people are in that situation, they panic, 
They go for the hatch. They want to open up the hatch thinking they're going to escape, but in fact, they hasten their own demise. So my, my worry is that I'm hoping nobody else in the sub would panic, and I was ready to gang tackle anybody who would do that. Mm -hmm. Then my scientific brain kicked in, and I started thinking, well, this is a problem, right? We have a problem, Houston, and, uh, but there must be a solution. I'm a professional problem solver. And so I started ticking off all the various ways in which I could imagine we could be rescued, but it was pretty quick um, that I realized uh, I, hit, I hit a brick wall, really, and couldn't think of a way, any viable way or any realistic way that we could re we could be rescued. And I think that's when a kind of resignation set in. And, and that's when the, that voice in my head, and I'll never, ever forget those words that came into my head. This is how it's going to end for you. And I thought it ironic because I'd been to the North Pole, the South Pole. I'd covered the Persian Gulf War, almost was killed with bullets flying all over the place. But I thought, this is it. This is how it's going to end. And then what flashed through my mind, and I'll never forget it, is I thought, my gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to join all the souls who lost their lives down here. I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to lay and rest. I mean, the rest of the, for eternity, my, my body is going to be down here with the rest of them who went down with the Titanic. And then I, I had a sense of peace, and that I can't explain. And then the sub went quiet. Uh, the, up until then, the, the engine was straining. Victor, our pilot, who was a former MiG pilot, as I said, was trying to rock us out of there, get us somehow dislodged from this giant thing that had kind of trapped us in there. And uh, after it got quiet, there was a sense of floating. And I, I know my diving buddy and I kind of exchanged glances as a, what, what happened? Well, one possibility is the engine just died from overexertion. And then we thought, well, we're really dead in the water now, literally. And, and then um, I, I dare, we hadn't talked to our pilot very much. We didn't want to distract him. He was focused on trying to get us out of there. He was our only hope. And so we didn't want to mess things up by, by distracting him with our yakking. But I, because there was this inflection in our journey with this quiet and the floating sensation, that we suddenly had, I dared to say just one word to him. I looked at him and I said, okay. And then he turned to me, as you saw in that video and the, the thick Russian accent, I'll never forget. He said, no problem. And then uh, the sense of relief was just, oh my goodness. I, it was like winning the lottery. It was beyond winning the lottery. It's unbelievable. Wow. Dr. Michael Gillen, honestly, it's, a, it's such a privilege to talk to you and and what an enormous relief. We just hope that same relief will come to, to the people on, on the sub. Because, you, you know, listening to you throughout the interview, it's, it's obviously had a massive, a massive impact on you, what's happening. Um, stay with us. We, we're going to talk to our uh, newspaper reporters here, Andrew and Kevin. I mean, just, just listening to somebody who's think? been there. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, I think there are I, I, lots I felt, of people... I, felt, I was there with him. Didn't you just? Yeah. I almost felt the sense of panic rising. Yeah. But do you know what? Also, I, one of the things that struck me, when he talked about um, in an emergency, your survival instinct yeah. kicks in, right? Yeah. So your automatic response is, get me out of That's here. That's right. So you would Try go that. to the hatch. So Michael said he was on standby to, to rugby tackle anybody yeah, yeah. who decided to do yeah. that. Make sense then yeah. why these guys are bolted in from Absolutely the outside. Absolutely right. Because if you open the hatch that deep down, That's you're, it. It's you, all you'll over. be crushed to death. Yeah. But it, but it was just listening, listening there and it was, it was incredibly engaging and compelling and, and also terrifying. Absolutely. Because there are five people in, what, a it's van. A, it's, a, yeah, it's the size of a van. You're, trap, you're trapped in and you just you don't know and you will go through all those... Uh, emotions and it is that uh, you know, and you can't talk too much down there you can't no, talk, don't because you don't want to use up the oxygen, oxygen. That's, yeah and that's going to be and you, you've got a 19 year old boy in there and uh, can everybody stay calm or yeah. would you panic i i think if it was me i'd probably be panicking and he uh, was uh, he was in that position for just over 60 minutes yeah. Yeah. these guys have been in this position since sunday yeah, yeah. um so god knows three what's days going on down there yeah, yeah. three days yeah yeah and, um, and yeah, the, look, the, lo the longer this goes on, the worse it is. I know the, 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 if the tapping, the noise is them, you've yeah. still got to get to them. And this is a race against time because Isn't the oxygen is running though? out. Banging with your, because one of your guests yesterday said, banging with your cup on the inside of the submersible can be picked up on a plane yeah. flying. And there has been. 
and it's been picked up. And it, we just hope that that is if, if them but, but, and that they can find it. But then they've still got to find the way to winch it to the surface, the but they can't do it too and, quickly. And, and, and then they've got to open it. And, and that is where I think there was more, more hope yesterday when we talked, 24 hours earlier we, sp we spoke about this mm. because there was, there was more oxygen but, then. But reading into it, this. why did it take eight hours to alert the Coast Guard? Mm. I want to just, I don't know if Michael Guillen is still with us. Yes, he's there. Um, I just want you to listen, uh, Michael Guillen, you've probably heard this already, but this is a podcast from the end of last year when a CBS journalist, mm. David Pogue, okay. interviewed... Um, Stockton Rush, who uh, owns uh, or runs Ocean Gate, which is the company that runs this sub and is on the sub as well. Just listen to what um, Mr Rush told CBS journalist David Pogue last November. There's a limit. You know, at some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed, don't get in your car, don't do anything. At some point, you're going to take some risk, and it really is a risk-reward question. I said, I think I can do this just as safely by breaking the rules. Does that strike you as a, as a cavalier attitude, considering the extraordinary dangers of going down to Titanic? Yes. In a word, yes. Um, Sounds very irresponsible to me. Look, I, I know there are thrill seekers out there. I went down there because I was a correspondent and I was given the opportunity to be the first TV correspondent to go down there. So I, I couldn't really turn it down, even though I have a deathly fear of water I have all my life. I thought this was my job. But uh, to hear that gentleman and especially the gentleman who's in charge of this to be speaking like that. And this is what was also concerning me, uh, Richard and Susanna. Uh, all day yesterday, uh, there was a kind of a jocularity, a kind of lightheartedness, a flippancy about all of this. Well, you know what? Um, I, I have been covering science beat. I've been all over the world. I've covered volcanoes, uh, mudslides, you name it. I often say that I've had a disastrous career because disasters are my beat. And I, I almost bought the farm. Um, not because I was reckless or any of the people in, involved were reckless, quite the contrary. These were very serious-minded people. The vessel I was in was specifically designed to be a scientific uh, uh, research vessel, unlike this one, which is designed specifically for tourism. And I even, I don't like the word tourism because it, it, it connotes something that is, I don't know, uh, more on the entertainment side. Mm. But when you're in the ocean, one of the things I did the night before I dove is I wanted to see what the people who lost their lives in the Titanic, the last things they saw uh, before they went down. I wanted to be, so I went up to the captain's deck all by myself. It was already very late at night. And I just leaned up against the rail and looked out over the North Atlantic Ocean. And two things came to, my, came, came to me that I'll never forget. Number one, the restlessness of the ocean. It just doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like this monster that's just ready to gobble you up if you're at all careless. For one second, it'll just swallow you up and it'll, and you will never be seen again. And of course, this is what happened to those poor people. Mm -hmm. And then the second impression that I had that will stick with me all my life is that when I looked around, I did a, a 360 degree, I just turned around in the deck and there was 360 degrees of nothing. This is what the people saw when they went down with the Titanic. There was no hope. There was nobody there that they could turn to or reach out to. There is nothing out there in the North Atlantic. We, so to hear somebody like that who's in charge of the lives of five people speak so, I'm sorry, but... Yeah. No, Mr. Gillian, I, I, no, we, 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 expected you, we expected you to have that reaction. Mm -hmm. We're almost out of time. Can I ask you just very briefly, you said something fascinating to me in your earlier testimony, that at a point when you really thought that was it, you had a sudden sense of peace and acceptance. And I took from that a kind of cold comfort for those five guys who are down at the Titanic as we speak. Because if they're, if they're not rescued, and that's a real possibility, if they're not rescued, do you think they'll, they'll find that kind of, of, of final acceptance? I wonder, Richard, I can't venture to say yes or no. It was just my experience. Um, it's just something that is beyond describing in words. It, I did, I've done my best to try to help people understand what these poor souls might be experiencing right now. 
for me, it was an uncanny, I would even so, so go so far, although I'm a scientist, so I have to be careful the words I use, I'm also a reporter, but it was a piece that I don't even completely understand myself to this day, but it was a piece, period. Thank you so much for telling your story. We, we really appreciate it. It's a real insight uh, into what may be going on down there as we speak. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Michael Gian. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, I, I read, it was down deep in that ocean. It's like being in space, apparently. Mm -hmm. It's so dark, it's so yeah. deep, it's icy. And cold. And cold, and the currents are so powerful. You think it's some homogenizing that doesn't move. It's, yeah. it's, it's lethal. At seven o'clock, uh, we will get the very latest from our correspondent, Noel Phillips, here. on what's um, that egg. Uh, and I'm going to just let us talk about it. So we, what you have heard from the man who was just God's grace setting free from that, him and his men, free from that danger. Um, let's hope that this is what happens. Let's trust the Lord that we do this for these people. Like he said, he said he felt that peace. I believe that peace came from God. It was as soon as that peace came, I believe angels came to rescue them. That's my belief. That's my belief. I remember one of his videos that I actually saw. He said it was the grace of God. That's what he said on that video. It was the grace of God that rescued them. That's what he said. You know, I think it's, you know, so... Um, what do you think about this trip having to go to down to the ocean deep down the ocean over 2000 12500 feet deep yeah for uh, for tourism what do you think about that do you think it's okay or do you just think well it's just like going to taking a plane driving a car it's just like going to space there's nothing wrong about it everything is risky so so I don't think there's anything bad about it. What do you think? About it? I can't even, I can't imagine. I just believe, I believe God's mercy bring them out. The um, Stockton Rush, the CEO of this particular Ocean Gate uh, um, uh, company that is, that is taking them with this uh, massive vessel, he'll come back and be able to design something different because his experience there will give him maybe more ideas on how to make it safer if people want to go. I mean, is, I think it's, a, um, I think it's very expensive, almost like, I think I had $250,000, $190,000 for pounds, something like that. So it's expensive to go. Um, for those who want to go, you know. Um, I hope, I just pray when he comes back, they'll be able to do something, all of them be able to come together and do something more safer, you know, for them. They haven't even got to the Titanic, like I said. It's two and a half hours down there, and they've only done an hour plus. So was, was there water leaking into it that led to something? What happened? I'm trusting the Lord that we'll hear from the amount what really happened. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and click the notification button so when you're on, you'll be able to, or you'll be notified. And let me know if you would like to visit a place like that. <laughs> if you if you would like to go, or somebody sponsor you, you would like to go, or you can do it for yourself and say, you know what, I'm going to go. I want to see what it's like that. I mean, I'm going to see what it's like going as deep as that in the ocean. Let us know. Thank you so much. Good to be here with you. Have a wonderful day.